Hello and welcome to Clinical Optics Made Easy. I'm M.N. Wiggins and this is the final lecture in the series Miras. So we're glad to have you. And on today's program you can see everything that we're going to talk about here. And I say this every lecture but in case people are watching these lectures in different orders, here's the book that everything that I'm going to talk about is in. There's a QR code. You can go to the website where you can find that. But you can read it any optics book you want as long as the language is written in a format that is easily understandable for you and it has lots of problems. So you want something that is going to test you so that you know that you're getting the information, but the key to working optics is working lots and lots of problems. So we're going to start out with a question here. The law of reflection states that the angle of incidence is equal to what? Here's hoping you said C it is equal to the angle of reflection. Now that was a fairly straightforward one. Here is something that you're more likely to get. A plane or plano mira, that's the one that's in your bathroom or in your bedroom, that gives an image that is what? Is it real, is it virtual, is it upright, is it inverted? Think about that. And here's hoping that you didn't have to think about that because you've been looking in mirrors your whole life. You know that when you look in a mirror, the image is upright. It's the same size. It should hopefully look like you. And that it's virtual. It's on the inside of the mirror. And that's kind of the difference between mirrors and lenses is that real images are on our side and virtual images are on the inside of the mirror. Now, if you're a six-foot person, how much mirror do you need to see yourself head to toe? And it turns out you only need about half of however tall you are. So if you're six feet, you need three feet of mirror because of the way that the rays bounce off of mirrors. So if you ever bought one of those full length mirrors, uh, you probably bought twice as much mirror as you actually needed. Hey, do you know which of these kinds of mirrors gives you minus virgins? Notice the way I phrase that. You can probably throw out plus lenses and there's no such thing as a minus prism. I'll help you out there. If you said convex mirror, you're exactly correct. So you see here, we have an object on the left, the rays are diverging, and then when they hit that mirror, they reflect off in a diverging pattern. So convex mirrors diverge rays. Now, what if we ask those same three questions that we asked on a plano mirror about a convex mirror? What are we getting out of that? Hopefully you will never miss a question on convex mirrors because convex mirrors always give you the same answer. It doesn't matter what size the object is, where the object's located. It always gives you exactly the same thing. The images are virtual, they're upright, they're minified, and they're closer than they may appear. In case you wanted something mathematical to hang on to with mirrors, here is a formula for the reflecting power of a mirror. It's one over the focal length or two over the radius of curvature. Now, because we're talking about convex mirrors right now, we're gonna put a minus sign in front of that. When we talk about concave mirrors here in just a minute, we're going to drop that minus sign. And here's an added benefit. Because the reflecting power of a mirror is measured in diopters, we can take one of these things, either one over F or two over R, drop it into U plus D equal V, and now start talking about where those images are gonna be located. See, U plus D over V is a great tattoo if you needed one. Where is the image formed from an object located 50 centimeters in front of a convex mirror with a radius of curvature of 20 centimeters? Well you know from your optical powers that radius of curvature is not going to be in centimeters. It's one of those things that must be in meters. Um, but before we get to that, where is U? And so U is, let's see, 50 centimeters in front of a convex mirror. We know that 100 divided by 50 is going to be minus 2. And so now we can figure out what D is because we know the radius of curvature. So let's do that. So here we go, we've converted centimeters to meters because we're familiar with the metric system and we've come up with a value of minus 10. And now we put it into U plus D equal V 
and we get our V is minus 12, but minus 12 is in diopters. We're asking for location, so we're going to divide that into 100 and get an answer in centimeters. But here's the question. Is it in front or behind the mirror? And we see the answer here of minus 8.33 to the right of the mirror, but what's really important that I want you to know here is that the image sign convention is opposite for mirrors than it is for the lenses. As you see here, plus V is to the left, minus V is to the right of the mirror or inside the mirror. So that's an important point. So whenever we are looking at our passenger side mirror in our vehicle, that is a convex mirror. Those images are upright. They are minified. They are virtual. And that is why you have that little sign often on your passenger side mirror that objects may be closer than they appear because the image is minified. And so uh, if you want to know mathematically, is it magnified or minified? It's still U over V and less than one is minified, just like with lenses. Hey, central ray concept. This is going to be your best friend when it comes to mirror problems. This slide is incredibly important. If you remember nothing else that uh, I tell you during this lecture, remember these three rays. But before we get into the rays, I want to tell you, here's a weird thing about mirrors. Like lenses, they have a primary and secondary focal point, but for a mirror, it's at the same location. It's only one focal point. All right, if we're going to draw central rays for mirrors, the first ray needs to start out parallel and then it must reflect through that focal point. And I'm going to show you a diagram, so bear with me. Second ray is going to start out through the focal point, and then it reflects back parallel. The third ray is like that uh, one central ray in the lens that just goes to the center of curvature. It does not reflect anywhere. It just kind of bounces back on itself. So it's through the radius of curvature, or for mirrors, we call that center of curvature. So here's our diagram. We have our three rays shown here. Once again, our first ray, which is the red ray in this case, is going to start out parallel and then it's going to diverge. But if we draw a virtual dotted line backwards, you can see that it goes through the focal length of the mirror, technically the focal point right there, but it goes through F. The second ray, which is the light blue ray, it's going to go directly through the focal point and you can see that it does that virtually, but then it has to emerge parallel, which it does. Lastly, you have the equivalent of the center of curvature or central ray lens, and it will go directly through the center of curvature, denoted as C there. Once again, it does that virtually, but you can see that these form three lines that tell you where the image is going to be. And remember, a convex mirror always gives you an image that is virtual, upright, and minified, as shown here. So here we go. What size, orientation, and type of image is formed by a concave mirror? And so here are your choices. Think about that for just a minute. And it's a trick question. The answer is it depends. It entirely depends on where that object is located. So whereas if you get a convex mirror question, it's always the same answer, concave mirror, not so much. These you have to remember a bit. So let's walk through these slowly. So you can see here the answer is inverted, minified, and real, but let's walk through it. Now in this diagram, they don't tell you what is the center of curvature and what is the focal point, but you should know. Remember in our formula that 1 over F equals 2 over R. So write that down and cross multiply it and you will see that F is equal to one half of R, meaning that the focal point is only half as far away from the mirror as the center of curvature. So another way of saying that is the center of curvature is twice as far away as the focal point. But in any case, the one that's farthest away is center of curvature and the other one has to be the focal point. So let's walk through what the rays are doing. You've got the red ray that is starting out parallel and then it's reflecting back through that focal point. The blue ray goes through that focal point, comes back for parallel, and then you have the center of curvature gold ray that goes through the center of curvature, aptly named, and then reflects back upon itself. And where those three rays intersect, you get an image that is inverted, minified, and real. Real because it's on our side of the mirror. Now, what if I put my object in between the center of curvature and the focal point. So you can see here, I've got my small object here and it's gonna give me a large inverted, yet still real image 
shown here as the dotted arrow upside down. Once again, three rays do the same things. So the primary red ray here, it's not really primary, the red ray goes parallel, hits the mirror, goes through the focal point, the blue ray goes directly through the focal point, comes out parallel, and the gold ray goes directly through the center of curvature. And where they intersect tells you where the image is going to be. That never changes. Now what do you think would happen if I put that object inside the focal point? Right, Because we've been outside the center of curvature, then we were in between the two points, and there's really only one place left to go, and that's inside both points. So what's it going to give us? Here you can see it gives you a virtual image, which is magnified and upright. But if you didn't know that, you don't have to know that on any of these on the concave mirror. What you have to do is sketch them out, and it will always give you the correct answer. I advise that over trying to remember this stuff. All you have to remember are how to draw the three rays. So here we've got it inside of those two points. The red ray starts out parallel, bounces through F. The blue ray goes directly through F, comes out parallel. The gold ray goes directly through C. And when you have to, you extend those virtually, which are the dotted rays that you can see here, and they all three intersect at the uh, formation of the image. So I bought probably the world's greatest blueberry muffin and I was gonna show it to you, and it was either take a picture of it or start eating it, and this happens. So, I, I'm, you know, is what it is, I guess. Let's, let's just move on. Let's say that you don't wanna do the, the three rays and, and you're looking for some sort of shortcut here. So here we go. I give you this and I say here's a location at A and a location at B and I'm going to be nice and I'm going to label which one is center of curvature and which one is focal point. And I say that I'm going to put my object at A and it's going to form an image at B and then you kind of need to tell me which of these five choices it is. So how are we going to figure that out? Well, number one, you could just sketch in an object at A and do the three rays and it would tell you what B looks like. Or you could have memorized uh, what is the answer when I have the object outside these two points. Or you could kind of use some deduction here. We know that the image is on our side of the mirror, so it must be real. So any choice that says virtual, let's throw that out. We also know that the image is closer to the mirror than the object and that's always going to equal minification. So anything that says magnified, I can throw those out. And now, you know, I'm down to kind of Vegas odds here. I've got two choices. It's 50-50. I'm going to get this right. But we don't have to guess here because we can figure out uh, what U over V is even without numbers. We know that U is going to be minus because rays are diverging from an object. And V is going to be positive because we're dealing with a mirror. Remember, this is how mirrors and lenses differ. When the image is on our side, then it's a plus V. So now we have a minus U over a plus V. And whenever U over V is minus, that gives us an inverted image. But I probably wouldn't do that, to be honest. I would probably sketch it out because that's so much easier. All you have to remember are three rays. The red ray goes parallel, goes through F, blue ray goes directly through F, comes out parallel, and then the gold ray goes right through the center of curvature, and that will give me the answer without any more thought than that. So just for fun, let's bring back a question from Lesson 8, our first Fun with Lenses uh, talk. And here we go. If a cornea has a radius of curvature of 6 millimeters, and the standardized refractive index is 1.3375, so we're gonna use this fudge factor here. What's the refracting power? So do you remember what formula we use for refracting power? We use this formula, where it's the absolute value of the difference in the refractive indices divided by the radius of curvature, which always has to be in meters. So let's plug in some numbers. So remember in this formula that M prime is what you're entering and N without the prime symbol there is what you're coming from. So we're entering cornea, 1.3375, and we're coming from air, which is 1. And so that gives us, should be something that looks like a K reading, maybe steep, but a K reading nonetheless. But now we're going to change it up. 
I'm going to give you the same cornea, but I'm going to ask, what's the reflecting power? So what equation do we need for the reflecting power of a surface? And once again, here it is. And so we're going to use either the radius of curvature, which it's giving us at six millimeters, or we're going to use the focal length. And it doesn't matter. Uh, we know that the focal length is one half of the radius of curvature. So we could use three millimeters and use minus one over F, or we could use six millimeters and go minus two over R. Either way we go, we've got to convert that into meters. And when we put the math to it, we see that the reflecting power of this cornea is minus 333 diopters. Now, the cornea people will likely never admit that. Why? Because they love to talk about what a big plus lens the cornea is. They love to talk about K readings and how great it is at refracting. And it is great at refracting. But it's a way better mirror. This is the secret truth. A way better mirror than it ever was a refracting surface. Why do you care? Because if you haven't already, it is in your future that you will be assisting in cataract surgery, and it is your job, should you choose to accept it, to squirt BSS on the cornea. And so the BSS bottle will be your weapon. And how do you know when to do that? Well, number one, make sure that when you do that, you don't get into the view of your surgeon. Keep your fingers out of the field. But the way that you know is using the reflecting mirror power of that cornea. So the light reflex from the microscope will show you discrete images on the cornea surface, that light reflex. When that image no longer has discrete borders, when they start to look fuzzy, the view is about to go cruddy for your surgeon and they will get grumpy and start to fuss at you. So right before that happens, you're watching the distinctness of those images, you squirt a little bit of BSS and that makes everybody happy. The only caveat is be careful doing that during capsular rexus. If they have the capsule in a pair of forceps and you squirt, sometimes the patient can jump and that is a terrible time for the patient to jump. So make sure that you're doing that right before they grab the capsule and anytime they let go of the capsule. Well, that wraps up what was a very short lecture and uh, we just didn't have a lot of ground to cover in mirrors. Uh, there are some things that you needed to know, those three rays, and, and we went through that. And I hope that that helps you. I want to once again thank Davis Street Publishing, but mostly I want to thank you for listening to these lectures. As always, the lectures are fine. The reading is a good idea, but you have to, have to, have to work lots of problems to get this in. And uh, I know that you will, and I appreciate you going into ophthalmology. It's a wonderful field, as, I, as you already know, uh, but I appreciate the fact that you have taken the time to listen to a topic that is not the most popular in our field. It's fun to listen to glaucoma lectures and retina lectures and cornea and all that jazz, but no one really wants to hear an optics lecture except maybe me and a handful of other people. So thank you for doing that. It shows your dedication to your education and to your patients. And so I feel very happy uh, with our future in ophthalmology. And I, I really appreciate you being here. I put up here that next up is the basics just as a cue to, to go back and listen to these again if need be. I hope that you have a great career. And thank you again for joining me for Clinical Optics Made Easy. Have a good day and best to you. Goodbye.